Um, welcome, everybody. We are still formally in um, executive session that we entered shortly after 6.30. So could I have a motion for us to leave executive session? Second. Motion, Councilor Fritz. Second, Councilor swift Kayada. Discussion on the motion to leave executive session. Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion is approved. We are out of executive session, in public session. And for those who just arrived, um, we did convene our regular meeting at 6.30. We had our roll call by the clerk, Pledge of Allegiance. We approved the minutes of our past meetings and we moved straight into executive session. So going back to where we left off on our agenda, we will pick up with reports and correspondence if there are any from counselors. I Councilor just, Lynch. I wanted to mention two things. The Comprehensive Plan Committee is having a public forum on June 15th at 7 p.m. here at Town Hall. Uh, we're halfway through our work. Um, and so we would encourage anyone who has an interest to come to that. Also, I wanted to mention that the Fort Williams Pay Display um, Working Group is having its first meeting tomorrow night. And that is a meeting of a group that was established to investigate the implementation of a pay display parking system at Fort Williams. Um, it will be making a recommendation to the council, I think by the June meeting. Um, so um, we will meet tomorrow um, right here at Town Hall at 7.30. Um, it is open to the public. Although it is a working group, it is not a public hearing. And the council will make any decisions. Um, this group is just coming up with a recommendation. So I just wanted to mention those two things. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor swift -Kayata. Um I have two things also. I'm, I'm also on the Comprehensive Plan Committee. and. Um, <clears throat> The committee asked me to pass along to the council uh, that they will be sending us a formal request, but they wanted to, uh, me to give a heads up that they will be asking for a short extension for their final deadline. Their final deadline from the council was to have the report completed by November of this year, and they would like to extend their deadline, I believe, till January, um, the following January of 07, because uh, they are we are all working industriously and making very good progress, but it's a very big task. And they felt trying to do public hearings and deliver a report right around the time of the holidays would not be a good idea. They figure it would be better after the first of the year. So that's just more an FYI. And secondly, um, I, I mentioned at a council workshop uh, a month or so ago uh, that I am on the United Way Foundation board for the United Way of Greater Portland. And you may have read about it in the press, people here may have read about it in the press, but um, the 211 answer line has gone um, live now. And what this is, is if you need to find any sort of services to help yourself or a family member or friend, if you're wondering where you can um, make a difference in, co in your community by volunteering, 211, if you dial 211 on the phone, um, it will connect you to sort of a central information resource area. This worked very, very well in Connecticut after the 9-11 emergency in New York. Apparently there were 800 or so, 800 lines, and it was very confusing for people trying to get services in Connecticut, um, southwestern Connecticut, which, which was affected by 9-11 also. Um, they had 211 lines all set up, and it was one source place for people to go. So there are these little magnets that say 211. I've given one to each counselor, and I've given a stack of them to the um, town clerk, and I believe they will be available at town hall. So I just wanted to make you aware it's a really good service, and I urge people um, to uh, get involved and to find out what 211 is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Dill. Um, yes, I, just a reminder that um, the deadline for filing for property tax relief under Maine's circuit breaker program is coming at the end of May. So if anyone's interested in um, exploring that, um, you could speak with Matt Sturgis in the assessor's office. <clears throat> Councilor Fritz. Yes, uh, I would, <clears throat> I'm, would like to bring the council up to date on and the public uh, on some work that I've been participating in at Regional Waste Systems. 
um, in exploring um, improving the recycling materials handling facility there to um, see whether we would invest in equipment to have single sorting of recycling in all of our communities in regional waste systems. So we've been looking at new equipment and, and the goal of the single stream really is to reduce the costs at the town level, <clears throat> particularly for hauling and handling uh, recycled materials. Um, it allows curbside communities to reduce labor because they don't have to sort at the curb and for transfer station communities, we can compact and um, haul a lot cheaper. Have it cuts the actual hauling cost uh, down to about a third of the current cost. Um, so I've been serving on the committee that's been looking at companies that provide equipment to do this kind of sorting and. Um, reviewing the RFPs that came in from three different companies and then a fourth one that would was uh, proposing that they operate the facility for IWS as a private venture. Um, so we evaluated those and chose one equipment company. The expenses were more than we had originally expected and the company that we recommended uh, would cost three point two million dollars to do the equipment. Um, we actually then went back and did some more negotiating with the company to operate just to explore whether some other scenarios might make it cheaper and an advantage to have someone operate it for regional waste systems. And we last week concluded that um, it still would be a better deal for regional waste systems to purchase equipment and to run the facility ourselves. Um, so that's what we're going to be recommending to the Regional Waste System Board this Thursday, and that um, half of the cost of that equipment could come from reserves and some surpluses that we were able to um, uh, you know, additional revenue that we got last year from electric power supply and additional material for recycling um, that can cover about half of the cost of that. And so we're anticipating at least considering borrowing 1.7, up to 1.7 million to put that in place. Um, I don't know how the board will vote, but that is what our recommendations been. And, it's been a very interesting process, and I think we can really make recycling easier for people and less expensive and gain more revenue from recycling in the future by using this process. Thank you. Anybody else? There are some seats um, up in front. If anybody standing would like to come down, you're welcome to stand. But I want you to know that there are seats available. Town manager's report. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. Uh, just a couple of items. First, I want to thank all those folks involved in the uh, hazardous waste collection day that occurred last Saturday. Uh, it was a little bit rainy, but fortunately, the public works garage was able to be opened up, and those that needed to unload things were able to do it inside the garage and, and not get wet. But it was our first real collection of universal waste, uh, computers and uh, fluorescent tubes and all those types of materials as part of the new universal waste law of the state of Maine and we appreciate all of the citizens who brought those items and didn't put them in plastic bags and hide them and instead brought them to the hazardous waste collection day because there's mercury in, in some of those devices and it's really important that we get mercury uh, out of the waste stream uh, because of the the harm that it that it does to the fish and otherwise to the environment so we're, we really appreciate all those that participated in that will be having another one, uh, I believe, this fall, Carol. Uh, that's being switched to twice a year instead of once a year. So uh, we'll be getting the date out on that. Uh, secondly, uh, last Friday, the uh, fire chiefs, police chiefs, the city manager of South Portland and myself met uh, over here in Cape Elizabeth to discuss uh, the 
where 911 calls will be answered. The uh, Maine Public Utilities Commission uh, has been going, went through a, uh, a, uh, a, what they would call a case, but uh, they looked at the different options of where dispatching ought to be, where, and particularly where 911 calls ought to be answered. Uh, we have had some discussions with Scarborough, uh, South Portland, and uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Scarborough, some of you may have read in the newspaper recently, was, was hooking up partially with Old Orchard. Uh, we were sort of caught, South Portland was insistent that it be in South Portland, Scarborough was insistent that it be in Scarborough. The PUC ruling was that Scarborough, South Portland, and Cape would share one. Uh, at the meeting on Friday, the, the, those at the meeting, and we didn't invite Scarborough to this particular meeting because they were going their own way, decided that uh, we would recommend to our respective councils uh, that the 911 calls for South Portland and Cape Elizabeth be answered in South Portland, uh, and that we uh, continue to pursue looking at merging into one dispatch center. Uh, to that end, in looking at that, it, it was suggested at the staff level, we have a working committee consisting of the police and fire chiefs of uh, both communities, as well as four dispatchers, two from each community. So there'd be four representatives of dispatchers and then four chiefs involved in the process. Uh, we didn't discuss giving them an exact timetable, but they would look operationally of how it might work, how it might be merged, uh, what the cost implications would be, et cetera. Uh, that will be a formal recommendation that will come to the council at your June meeting. Uh, and it, it was the unanimous recommendation of all uh, six in attendance at the meeting, uh, the, the four chiefs and the acting manager of South Portland and myself. Uh, this does not foreclose the possibility of us uh, cooperating with the town of Scarborough. Uh, we, we welcome Scarborough uh, into that group uh, and you know, look forward perhaps to uh, continuing discussions with them. But it's, we need to make a decision according to the current PUC rule by July 1 in terms of you know, deciding where the 911 calls are going to be answered. So I, I, what I really like about the suggestion is it, it solves the immediate, would solve the immediate PSAP issue as far as giving an answer back to the state. But even more so, it involves the employees in uh, the discussions and deliberations a lot more in terms of ultimately what happens with, with all of the dispatching other than the 911 calls. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Because uh, that's something hadn't been communicated at all to the council. That's, that's new information. Uh, also, I did want to make mention of two retirements uh, that are occurring uh, this month. Uh, one is uh, in the police department. Alan Westbury is retiring after about 33 years of service. I think he's the senior member of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department by one month. Uh, Vaughn Dyer came in a month after him. And we all wish uh, Alan the very best. He was out there picketing today and uh, you know, making known his wishes on certain issues. And you know, while we may disagree on an issue or two along the way, you know, that doesn't take away at all from uh, all the great work that he's done, all the, all the nights that he's worked. Uh, the holidays and uh, all of the, the families that he's helped in Cape Elizabeth uh, over the years as a police officer. He's been, I've really enjoyed working with him and always liked Al and uh, really wish him well. The second retirement uh, is actually the, the brother of our police chief, uh, although he probably doesn't like to be known that way, uh, kiddingly, but Hap Williams or Bob Williams uh, has actually worked with us off and on for 41 years, uh, since 1965. He, uh, he was a full-time, uh, firefighter for the city of South Portland. And while he was a full-time firefighter, he, he, he always worked uh, during most of that time uh, with our Cape Elizabeth Public Works Department, plowing snow and, and taking care of equipment. He always had a lot of skills as a mechanic. Uh, when he retired from the South Portland uh, Fire Department now, I forget the exact number of years, but about a dozen years ago, he came to work full-time here uh, as the mechanic operator uh, for the uh, public Works Department taking care of a lot of the school bus issues, the, the public works trucks, the police cruisers, and uh, you know the, the rest of our fleet. So uh, you know he's going. They're both going to be missed. I know you joined me in wishing them well, and the police and fire departments having a luncheon for them uh, next week, and uh, they'll be uh, formally recognized at that time. But uh, I want to thank them for their service to the community. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. And thank you for that report. 
which brings us to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. And this is a time for anyone who would like to speak as to any issues that are not on tonight's agenda uh, to do so. Is there anyone? Seeing none, we will move on to our agenda items. The first item on our agenda is item number 99-2006, the Municipal School Community Services and County Budgets. And I would first like to welcome a lot of familiar faces back to tonight's meeting. And I'll repeat what I said before. If anybody would like to take a seat, there are some up in front. Uh, you are welcome to. You're also welcome to stand. But if anybody would like to sit, there are some seats scattered throughout. And on this um, item number, I would like to make a motion. Um, I make the following motion in keeping with the pledge that Councilors Fritz, Lynch, Moles, Swift, Kayata, and I made on September 13, 2004. Whereas on September 13, 2004, six of the then seven members of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council individually committed themselves to limit spending in the next three years to a level not more than the rate of the consumer price index, with the exception of voter approved debt and an allowance for additional school enrollment and population growth. And whereas during the 2005 calendar year, the consumer price index, all urban consumers, common, commonly referred to as the CPIU, increased at a rate of 3.4%. And whereas from the 2005 to the 2006 fiscal year, school enrollment in Cape Elizabeth increased by 21 students, or 1.15%. And whereas from the 2004 to the 2005 fiscal year, the most recent year for which complete numbers are available, the number of new houses in Cape Elizabeth increased by 25 or 0.7 percent. And whereas after applying the percentages of increase in school enrollment and new housing to the portions of the school and town budgets that are fairly considered to be variable with enrollment and population, an increase of $93,247 for the school budget and $38,025 for the town services budget, in addition to an increase of 3.4% based on the rate of increase in the CPIU, is appropriate and consistent with a commitment made by the town councilors on September 13, 2000. Four. Therefore, be it ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council having held a public hearing on Wednesday, April 26, 2006, does hereby adopt the general fund budget for fiscal year 2007 with gross expenditures of $28,394,728 and gross revenues of $7,000,000 $479,562, and with the amount of $21,163,466 to be raised from taxation, and to fix October 3, 2006, and Tuesday, April 3, 2007, as the dates upon which, eat, upon which one half of such tax is due and payable with interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date at the rate of 11% per annum, and as further set forth in the agenda published for this evening and which will be on the town website after tonight. Second. Second, Councilor swift Kayata. Discussion on the motion. Councilor Malls. I've prepared a few remarks because I'm not always as eloquent as I would like to be, and it's much easier to read remarks than it is to speak off the cuff. Uh, and I'd like to make my comments early because, you know, in this discussion, I would like to make a good faith attempt to convince a majority of the council to consider the budget proposal that I made at the last finance committee meeting prior to other councillors making any prepared <coughs> statements 
that might box them into a position that they're unwilling to look beyond. As I've previously stated, when I made the commitment to hold the line on spending in September 2004, I meant it, and I still mean it. However, who could have anticipated almost two years ago that the price of heating oil and gasoline would have increased at the rate it did? Who would have ever guessed that after the voters spoke in June of 2004 and overwhelmingly said they wanted the state to fund 55 percent of education and 100 percent of special education costs, that everyone in our legislative delegation, Senator Lynn Bromley, Representative Connie Goldman, Representative Jane Eberly, along with the majority of the legislature, would all vote to overrule the citizens' referendum and stick Cape Elizabeth with the bill for increased special education costs as shown in the school board's budget request. Tonight, as I did last month, I propose the following budget compromise, that we hold the school department to the CPIU spending cap of 3.4 percent to keep our commitment to the taxpayers, but that we go one step further and due to the unforeseen circumstances previously mentioned, we exclude the increased fuel oil cost of $171,611, calculated using the manager's projected price of $2.20 a gallon. Uh, the town doesn't have to pay the taxes that uh, citizens do on cost of oil. And increased special education cost of 102446 for a total exception of these two extraordinary costs of 274057 which is an increase of about 4.95 percent for last year's school budget. I am aware that over the past few weeks, several of the town council members have been meeting one-on-one -on -one to come up with a consensus spending number for the 2006 school and municipal budgets. It's my understanding that they rediscussed the language in the council resolution adopted on September 13, 2004 for guidance which language was resolved, the currently elected members of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council individually commit themselves to limit spending in the next three years to a level not more than the rate of the consumer price index, with the exception of voter approved debt and an allowance for additional school enrollment and population growth. I'm also aware that at least five of those councillors have come to an agreement on a number. It is my understanding, as was recently stated, that they agreed to make an adjustment to the previously mentioned 3.4% CPI factor to account for growth in enrollment and population. That they further agree that the town's population has risen slightly, 25 homes, and that enrollment from 2004 to 2005 has gone up 21 students. On the, munip on the municipal side, this has resulted in their willingness to increase the municipal budget about $38,250. On the municipal side of the budget, the manager did a very good job of living within the spending cap. I do take exception with the council's willingness to defer the necessary repairs to Spurwink Road. It is a major access road and it should be made safe to travel. As on the same section, being on the same section as that is being repaired through state grants. I propose we accept the municipal budget as proposed, including the $38,000 population adjustment, but direct the manager to fix Spurwink Road and direct him to find the money within the existing resources or from the undesignated fund balance. On the school side, several councillors have come up with a per pupil cost of about $4,400, based on only variable costs of their choosing. This yields a school budget increase of 3.4 percent plus approximately $93,247. While I applaud them for their hard work, I must remind them there is no language in the resolution defining the cost per student as only those variable costs chosen by those counselors. In fact, for consistency, since the practice last year and this year has been to apply the CPI to the entire school budget, excepting debt, so should the cost per student 
be derived by dividing the entire 2005 school budget, accepting debt, by the number of students. That would yield a spending, in, spending increase consistent with the pledge that I made in September 2004 of 3.4% plus a little over $180,000. In fact, we had a budget proposal a little bit earlier in the season uh, which was passed around and the number chosen was $8,600 per student. Uh, almost twice what's being proposed by these other counselors tonight. And I mean that with all, with all respect and hoping that they'll listen to what I'm saying and, and bend a little bit. As I mentioned last month through this budget process, uh, I've been warned by other counselors and the public that the council would have to pay a political price for increasing the school budget beyond the CPI. However, I was elected to do the right thing. If the council needs to pay that price, so be it. Using the other council's methodology and being consistent with the calculation for cost per student as with the calculation of the budget increase based on CPI, we're only around $96,000 apart. Since a number of those 21 students also adds the cost of special education, which the school board's budget already shows is taking a jump of 102,000 because the state reneged on what it was supposed to do for us, you can easily account for the difference between our two numbers. Either way, the calculation all comes back to the original school funding, school budget funding proposal of 3.4% CPI plus an increase of about 274,000. As far as my vote goes, I'm not going to punish the students and the staff for the council's decision to go with a rigid spending cap, blind to what is going on around us in the area of fuel costs, special education costs, uh, and calculated using inconsistent assumptions. I therefore make a motion to amend the proposed budget to meet the following numbers, that the school budget would be 18 million $425,104, town services $8,311,160, uh, community services stays the same at $952,000, county assessment stays the same at $888,249, uh, total budget of $28,578,513, uh, with the other numbers adjusted accordingly for revenues and, and net to taxes. Council Moles, could you repeat your number for the school budget on the motion to amend? It was 18 million. 18 million, 425,104. It's uh, okay. about, about $180,000 more than uh, the proposal. And the, just so we have it for the, the minutes as well, the town budget on your amendment is 8,311,160? Or, or, okay, or essentially what you had proposed earlier. There's really no change on the, okay. the town budget. Yeah. I, I estimated them before the meeting, so I could be off by a couple dollars, but essentially what the proposal was. Is there a second to the motion to amend? Hearing none, the motion fails. Continuing discussion on the motion? Comments? No more discussion? Councilor Dill. I didn't hear a speech, but I'll give one. <clears throat> I, first of all, just want to thank everybody who um, communicated with me during this process. It was very educational, and I enjoyed it very much, and I'm very uh, proud to be among so many educated people who really taught me quite a lot about uh, not only education, but uh, communication and uh, civic pride. <clears throat> I also want to thank the town council um, 
who uh, implemented in 2004 the spending cap because now we all know what it will be like to live with Tabor. <clears throat> um, we know that if Tabor is implemented, we won't discuss the merits of what a school system needs or what a town needs. We're going to discuss and try to figure out um, how many kids are going to enroll in the school in the future and how much does each child cause all these things that, in my opinion, just are not, um, don't get at the merits of what a budget discussion should be. So I want to thank you all for giving us that heads up about what we can expect if Tabor is implemented. I also want to thank um, what I believe are five counselors who are going to um, compromise somewhat because I like I had hoped uh, early on that there would be a compromise. Um, obviously people have moved and that's that's a good thing. Um, I'm not going to be voting for the motion because in my opinion it's just not enough money for the schools. Um, I think that uh, the spending cap as it was adopted by the individual counselors um, was done in good faith, but I also think it was fear-based, and I think the reluctance to increase the budget in accordance with what the school feels it needs, or at least in accordance with what I consider to be common sense, um, is also fear-based, that tapers on the horizon, and that um, rather than lead with um, what we want uh, in mind and what we know is right, we're leading uh, with fear of some tax. And I, I have the utmost respect for my fellow counselors, but I just I'm going to um, not vote for the motion because I don't think that that's what we should be doing as leaders. Um, I had a great quote from one of our constituents today that uh, I'll share, and that was that we need to be alert to these cracks in the veneer. And I see some cracks in the veneer of this great education that we have in Cape Elizabeth. And I think just like when that light goes on in your car that says, you know, it's time to bring it in for service, you can ignore it but usually you're not saving yourself any money or any problems down the road. It's just, you, you just got to take it head on. And I think that by implementing a budget with only an increase of the 3.93%, we're, we're missing some of those cracks. So um, thank you all. And I just wanted to uh, get those remarks on the record because I did not take the pledge. And um, I looked at the school budget um, on its merits and didn't think too hard about whether or not I was keeping a promise or breaking a promise. I just uh, feel that uh, what's being offered to the schools isn't enough. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Dill. Councilor swift -Kayana. I too would like to thank everybody who participated in this pro process. It's, um, it's been long. It's been difficult at times. I know it's been frustrating for um, some members of the public who haven't uh, uh, understood the, the laborious process and the way it works with the public hearings and that. But I do want to thank everybody that contacted me or that uh, contacted other counselors or spoke to us or gave us a phone call. I got a phone call today on, from somebody driving in her car. And um, it, it's. It's been a, a wonderful example of democracy in action, and it's the way the process is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. I did prepare some remarks um, because I wanted to be very careful about what I said to make sure that I was accurate. And I, like Councillor Moles, didn't want to speak completely off the cuff. In thinking about this issue, I went back to how my, uh, the initial pledge was made. And I remember back, it wasn't so long ago, to 2004, when I think the schools and the community of Cape Elizabeth faced their greatest threat ever, which was the Pulaski tax referendum. And it was something, as Councillor Dill says, to be afraid of. As a former Cape Elizabeth Middle School Parents Association president, I opposed the Pulaski initiative because it would have mandated substantial cuts, $3 million, over $3 million to our school budget, as well as drastically cutting um, public safety, library, and other municipal services used by children and adults alike in our community. And as treasurer of Citizens United, the political action committee that has worked uh, against Pulaski and is now working against Tabor, I helped lead this, the successful statewide effort to defeat Pulaski. 
As Councillor Moles mentioned, uh, together with five other town councillors at the time, I pledged in September of 04 that if the voters trusted us by defeating the Pulaski Initiative, that I would vote to, and I quote, limit spending in the next three years to a level not more than the rate of the Consumer Price Index, with the exception of voter-approved debt and an allowance for additional school enrollment and population growth, unquote. This pledge was discussed publicly. It was, dis it was on the agenda several times. It was posted on the website. It, it was pretty well known. It was previewed in writing with the superintendent and the chair of the school board, and not a single member of which objected. Many town councils statewide made similar pledges because we were afraid of Pulaski and because we thought Pulaski would devastate our communities. During last fall's council, uh, uh, town council election campaign, I reaffirmed my pledge, and I intend to keep my pledge. We teach our children by example, and I think that promises are meant to be kept, not abandoned, when found to be inconvenient or difficult. Some say that circumstances have changed since this promise was made. I understand that comment. But circumstances always change, and everybody knows that. Over the past three years, school spending in our town has increased. These are actual years. School spending in our town has increased 17.6%. As currently funded, our schools are excellent. In March 06, the State Department of Education recognized the middle school and Pond Cove School as consistently high-performing schools based on student test scores. And 18 months ago, Cape High School, as the highest-performing high school in Maine, was named as one of only 250 Blue Ribbon schools nationwide by the U.S. Department of Education. A spending increase for the coming year per our pledge maintains this excellence. So here are the factors I considered in deciding on how to vote on the budget tonight. Um, as Chairman Backer mentioned, the Consumer Price Index for the year ended December 2005 and also the year ending, the 12 months ending March 2006, the most recent month that we have data for, is 3.4 percent. Actual school enrollment for fiscal year 06 has increased since the council last approved a school budget. And projected for enrollment for fiscal year 07 is the subject of debate and is indeed uncertain. So giving more weight to actual figures rather than to projected figures, in my mind, justifies an allowance of $93,247 above the CPI to the school budget for additional school enrollment consistent with the pledge. And the increased number of actual Cape Elizabeth households from 2004 to 2005 justifies an allowance of $38,025 above the CPI for the municipal budget for population growth consistent with the pledge. Therefore, in keeping with the pledge that I made, I will be supporting the motion. I do so not only because it's consistent with my promise to the citizens, but also because it, it, is, it is, I truly believe in the long-term best interests of all the citizens, including children and parents of Cape Elizabeth. Would it be nice to give additional funding to the schools, to the library, to paving roads, to maintaining Fort Williams, and so on? Certainly. I don't think anyone would argue, argue with that. That's why many of us make donations of our money or of our time to the Education Foundation, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, the Library Foundation, town boards and commissions, and the many, many volunteer organizations in town. But breaking promises about how we will spend taxpayer money will ultimately harm our schools and our community by encouraging voters to impose stricter caps, like the Taxpayer Bill of Rights referendum that will be on the statewide ballot this fall. And it is a much stricter, Tabor is a much stricter cap than what we are talking about. And, um, and that is why I am working again another year as treasurer of the statewide pact to fight against it. So in conclusion, I gave my word 
and I will keep it tonight. Thank you. Councilor Lynch. I didn't prepare any remarks, but um, just a few things I want to say. I do support um, the motion, um, but I do want to say if I were convinced that the promise that we made um, a year and a half ago was a bad promise, I would break it. Um, however, in the time of declining school enrol enrollments, I believe that a budget increase commensurate with the cost of living will provide sufficient resources to continue the quality of our school system. Now, I am supporting the growth factor for the reason that I have listened to school board members and I've listened to some of my fellow counselors who have proposed that we look at last year's growth. And I've come to believe that um, projections are always subject to dispute. We don't know who's going to move in. So um, I'm satisfied that looking at last year's growth is a very rational way to deal with the growth factor. Um, and I just also want to um, echo what Ann just said. I truly feel, having worked hard to um, oppose Pulaski and hearing from only one person 18 months ago um, against making the pledge that if we were to break our promise um, tonight, I truly feel that we will fuel the tax cap movement and we will put our schools and our municipal services as well, our police and fire, at um, extreme risk in the future. So I do support the motion. Thank you. Councilor Fritz. Yeah, I'd like to echo other people who have said they appreciate the emails and the activism that has been um, in the community about the budget. Um, I've read all of them, and I haven't been able to answer all of them, but I certainly have read them all. Um, and we usually don't have that much interest in the budget process, and so it's, it's refreshing, even a group that went through the municipal budget and was making some suggestions. Um, I do think some, there have been some exaggerations about the devastating impact on the schools if, if we stuck to some limits. Um, and, and I don't think it has been fair to, to necessarily compare the cost per student with Falmouth and, and Yarmouth, and because I think that their budgets include different things than Cape Elizabeth, and we have a real one, to one town process that we include a lot of items for the schools in the municipal side of the budget, so it's, it's hard to make those comparisons. Um, I certainly favor excellent schools in Cape Elizabeth. But I think that we do have excellent schools, and um, we have had students that definitely excel in the state, and we certainly have uh, all of our students get into the best colleges in, in the country. Um, and I think we've had substantial increases in the school budget over the nine years that I've been on the council seeing and reviewing the budget. <clears throat> Uh, but I think we have to be mindful of everybody in the community, people on fixed income, and, and I don't think the sky is the limit on, on spending. I think it's important to have controls. I, I, I'm glad to hear we're moving forward a bit on some uh, the dispatch, um, trying to regionalize a bit, and I've been trying to advocate for the schools to, to regionalize some of the things, and, and I think that's going to be necessary in, in the future. Um, most of the emails that we've gotten have been um, from people that do have children in the schools, but I have gotten many emails from people who say, hold the line, you're doing the right thing. Um, I got a call as well, <laughs> just this afternoon, someone in the car um, saying, hold the line, uh, people that I just pass that I know in, in town saying it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, so I will keep my promise um, and I'll vote for the main motion. Um, 
I think that calculating the increase in enrollment and, and households in the community, both for the school budget and the municipal budget, makes sense in terms of calculating it based on fixed costs. And um, I think it is in the spirit of the pledge that I took a couple years ago. Councilman McKinney. I, I too would like to thank everybody who was involved in this process, those here and those who attended meetings and those who emailed us and called us. I, I got a phone call as well this afternoon. I don't know <laughs> if this was coordinated or what. But it really it didn't make any difference at that point because a budget process is a process of working with other people to build consensus. And even though I would have liked to have seen a, a larger uh, spending allotment per student than what we're going to um, pass this evening, at least I think we are, you can't do it that way. It's not about what I think, it's about what we think as a group. And the, the most effective budget is the one that has the most support. And if you, if you look at what we've gone through in the negotiations we have um, put together, it's been a very important process because some people started at a very low number, others started at a higher number, and we've been able to work out a compromise that we can live with. It's not going to satisfy everybody. It's going to be more money spent than some people would like to see spent. It's going to be less money than other people would like to see. But the, the fact of the matter is we had to come up with a consensus that works for the town. So I will be supporting the budget this evening. Thank you. I guess that leaves it to me. Um, I'd merely like to add to um, a few of the statements that have already been made. And I agree that we should all be proud to live in a community where people demonstrate the well-articulated passion that we've heard over the last few weeks and thank everyone who has participated. From all the comments that we've received, whether it be via email or telephone calls or handwritten letters that we've received or the public comments at the various hearings, I've sort of drawn out three common threads that have run through virtually all of them. The first is that everybody who's participated in this dialogue has done so because they care about the quality of life in Cape Elizabeth. And that's true whether they have lived here for a year, and we have heard from some of those people, or whether they have lived here for a lifetime, and we have heard from some of those people. The second, I guess, truth that I've distilled from all these comments is that regardless of where people stand on the budget, whether they think we should support the school budget's recommended, the school board's recommended budget increase of 6.95%, or whether we should stand by the pledge as it's come to be known. Without exception, those people are all proud of our school administrators, our teachers, the parents and the students. And without exception, they all recognize the importance of the role that the schools play in making Cape Elizabeth one of the most desirable communities in the state of Maine in which to live. And the third thing that I've drawn from this is something that we've all recognized before, but it merits saying again, and that is that reasonable minds can differ. We've heard from bright and thoughtful people expressing a wide, vastly different range of views on what we should be doing tonight with our vote on the budget. We have heard differing views from citizens. We have heard differing views from members of the school board. And we have heard differing views from members of the town council. There is no one right answer to the many questions inherent in setting a budget of $28 million. Neither is there any answer that is inherently wrong. 
and there are about 28 million reasons why people should care and voice an opinion on how the town council approaches a budget and on the action that the council takes tonight. With regard to the school budget, we have heard comments from folks who have made a point of saying that Cape Elizabeth doesn't spend as much per student as our peer communities. This isn't a Soviet style Cold War arms race. Despite not spending as much as our peers, our schools have had consistently the highest test scores of any of our peer communities. Just last week, the Cape Elizabeth High School was recognized by Newsweek Magazine's ranking of high schools nationwide as being within the top thousand high schools in the country. And it was an increase in ranking of a couple hundred places from the prior year. And that's a wonderful credit to our school administrators, to our school board, to Principal Jeff Shedd and his staff, to the teachers, and to our high school students. And we're all, we're all proud of the fact that our schools are among the best in the state of Maine. And our town consistently does more with less money on both the school side and on the municipal side than our peer communities. And I agree with the comment that was made, I think it was by Councilor Swift Kayata, that it would be nice to live in a community where the schools and the town received everything they want. But unless you live in one of the few states like Alaska or Wyoming or Nevada that have vast oil or mineral or gambling resources, all of those wants come with a very specific price tag and an expense to each homeowner and taxpayer. And the tax burden on the citizens is something that I take to heart. And depending upon which study you read, Maine is either at the very top of the list with the absolute number one heaviest tax burden of any state in the country, or it ranks somewhere below that. Regardless of whether our tax burden is number one or whether it's something less than that, we on a local level have to bear some accountability for whatever that tax burden is. And I never envisioned that as an elected official that I would be taken to task for not spending enough or not taxing citizens enough. But all things considered, I am satisfied that we are spending enough and that we're taxing enough and I support the motion. All those in favor of calling the question, cutting off the bait. The motion carries. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion is approved. Five in favor. Councilors Dill and Malls opposed. The next item on our agenda is item number 100. Dash 2006, acceptance of state funds, and we'll take a short break for people to leave who would like to leave.
Yes. Okay, let's resume with item number 100-2006, acceptance of state funds. Um, I move that the council accept the categories of funds listed in our agenda as provided by the state of Maine. I second the motion. Second, Councilor McKinney. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor? The motion is approved, seven in favor, none opposed. Item number 101-2006, education budget. I move that the town of Cape Elizabeth appropriate 14 million dollars and 62 cents for the total cost of funding public education from kindergarten through to grade 12 as described in the Essential Programs and Services Funding Act, and that the town of Cape Elizabeth raise $10,829,620 as the town's contribution to the total cost of funding public education from kindergarten to grade 12 as described in the Essential Programs and Services Funding Act in accordance with the Maine Revised Statutes, Title 20-A, Section 15688, and as further described in great detail in the agenda. Second. Second, Councillor Lynch. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Was that opposed? Six in favor, Councilor Moles opposed. Next item is number 102-2006, Municipal and Community Services LD1 Compliance. And I'd like to move that we certify that the fiscal year 2006 tax commitment for Municipal and Community Services excluding overlay was $4,550,000 and that the council is hereby declares its intent through the adoption of this motion to exceed the LD1 voluntary tax levy limit by $134,980 all as more specifically set forth in our agenda. Second the motion. Second Councilor McKinney. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. The motion is approved. Can I just ask on that last motion, was that two opposed? No, it was none opposed. No, well, not this one. But the previous one? No, the one. previous was six in favor, Councilor Moles opposed. Okay, I thought I saw another hand go up. I that think my hand same. lingered. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think. Just the tax side. Yeah, 6-1. Well, it's done. Yeah, it's done. Could I? I, I would yeah. move to consider items 103 to 109 unblocked. Second. All those in favor of the motion? Is there a hand up? The seven in favor, none opposed. So we are taking items number 103 through 109 as one group. May I have a motion as to those items? I um, would move the adoption of, and I will um, 
read out the funds. Um, the sewer fund budget, the Riverside Cemetery fund budget, the Spurwink Church fund budget, the Fort Williams Park Capital Fund, the Thomas Jordan Fund, the Rescue Fund, and the Portland Headlight Fund at the amounts set forth in our agenda. Second. Second, Second Councilor Moles. <coughs> Discussion on the motion. All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed. The motion is approved. Which brings us to the conclusion of all of the budget items. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item number 77-2006, uh, which is an item that was tabled from our last monthly meeting concerning um, a recommendation from our ordinance committee on the town mooring ordinance. Is there a motion to remove this item from the table? <coughs> Seeing none, um, this item requires no action by the council, which the effect of which is to leave the existing mooring ordinance in place as previously approved by the council and as recommended by our ordinance committee. Next item. 110-2006, acceptance of gift from Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Uh, I would move acceptance of the gift of $2,500, um, the purpose of which is to underwrite special programs um, at the Thomas Memorial Library to celebrate on July 8, 2006, the 20th anniversary of the last major library renovation. Sick. A motion and second by Councilor Fritz. Discussion on the motion? I'd just like to note as a member of the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation that the $2,500 that is proposed to be spent here is not money that came from taxpayers. This is money that came actually as a grant from another foundation to the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation for this very purpose. And Jay Sherma, our library director, is here nodding consent, or at least affirmation that what I'm saying is correct, yes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you want to tell anything about the... Um, and Jay, would you like to say anything about what this is for or not? Don't feel compelled to, but you're welcome to. I, I would just and if you do want to, you'll need to come to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman uh, Backer. Um, I would just like to say that the um, funds that have been received uh, or will be received from the foundation uh, will be used to uh, kick off the summer programs at the library and at the same time celebrate the 20th anniversary of the facility's uh, current uh, uh, makeup. Uh, we tentatively uh, called the celebration Building Connections. Uh, which is a deliberate pun, first on the fact that the last renovation project literally connected two buildings. Uh, but more importantly, in a, uh, a less literal way, it has allowed the library to build connections between children and literature and lifelong learning. It's enabled the library to uh, make connections with other library facilities through the Minerva network, um, to provide space for the public to have public interest meetings, and it's a wonderful facility, and we're very appreciative of this opportunity to celebrate what we have and what we can do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. All those in favor of the motion? The motion is approved, seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Next item is item number 111-2006. A proposal, a Nordic, Nordic ski proposal um, the Nordic Ski Group um, is making further presentation to us as a follow-up from having been before us, I believe, twice before. And is that what we have the uh, PowerPoint set up for? There's about a 50% chance we'll be writing about very seconds. 
Sounds like a definite maybe to me. With, uh, he met with us and the town manager, the town planner, uh, a representative of the conservation committee, and a representative of the ski mobile club. And those are the bullets that are actually pressed there. We were uh, very impressed with how he made use of the uh, terrain that was out there. And I uh, believe that uh, it really offers some challenging climbs and opens up some beautiful vistas and will be uh, uh, a real asset to the community. Uh, we also met with the DEP, uh, and they were enthusiastic because even though it's more extensive uh, than what was originally proposed, it has less impact on the wetlands. And we uh, believe that uh, sharing it in the winter months with the ski mobiles will be beneficial uh, for uh, both of us and uh, also provide a packed surface for uh, other users in the winter. The DP. Uh, did say, I should go back, um, what we're proposing is that uh, we go ahead with phase one, which is the section north of the transfer station. Uh, that is outside the designated wetland areas, and so the DEP uh, said they really had no concerns with us proceeding in that area. And it's also the area that uh, is uh, the highest priority for us because of the terrain that's uh, available in there. Uh, as you know, the trails in the Gulf Crest area uh, have not really uh, been developed in this area yet. You had asked for a budget, and we did prepare a budget. We spent about $3,000 to date. And I think you saw a preliminary budget uh, in John Morton's proposal. Oh, we began fundraising a couple weeks ago, and we have uh, over $10,000 pledged which is about 25% of our uh, projected budget. We also met with the town engineer, Steve Harding at OST, and uh, we would like to contract OST to help us prepare for the town uh, the materials that the DP needs to decide whether any additional uh, permitting is required. Basically, they wanted to see the 
impact uh, the trail on the uh, the new trail on the Uh, imposed on the OS map showing the designated wetlands and uh, also show what modifications in those areas that we are proposing and so they would uh, develop the construction details of the culverts required there but basically it eliminates about 550 feet of boardwalk uh, and replaces that with uh, about three culverts What we're requesting of the town council is to approve the course flagged by John Morton and uh, approve the trail committee uh, going forward with uh, phase one. In parallel with that, we'd like to uh, submit to the DP the materials for them to make a decision on phase two. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yes, I'm Muzzy Barton. I'm uh, past president of Cape Nordic and also have been involved with the middle school coaching program. And um, David, I think, is, has touched on most of the major points that we wanted to make tonight. Um, I just thought I'd just add a, a few, few um, anecdotes to some of the things David has mentioned. Um, when we initially proposed to hire John Morton um, to design the trail, there was actually admittedly some skepticism in the Cape Nordic um, meeting as to whether or not we should, should spend $2,000 to hire a professional trail designer to come. And um, we tossed it back and forth, and, and the, the, the majority ruled, and, and um, the consensus was that, yes, we should invest that amount of money and hire John Morton. And there was one member of our committee, uh, Rob Yokobaskis, who I, unfortunately is not here tonight, at least I don't think he is at this point. And Rob was one of those dissenting viewpoints on whether or not we should spend the money to hire John Morton. And um, it was interesting, in our last uh, Goldcrest Trails Committee meeting, of which Rob Yokobaskis is a member of our group, um, the first thing that he said was, boy, did we ever spend our money right. He was so impressed with the amount of um, preparation and terrific design that was um, brought forth by John Morton. We were um, all thrilled. In fact, I know a large number of the, in fact, I think everyone on the Conservation Commission and uh, men, many members of our com community have gotten out and had a chance to walk the flag trail that John Morton proposed. And I think everyone has been very impressed. And um, we really hope that we can uh, move forward with our project a lot of time and energy has already been expended, um, but certainly there's a lot of work to be done, and um, we really hope that the town council will vote favorably upon this so that we can get going on our, our, our clearing and our work parties, um, mu much of which will be volunteer work parties, so that we, in fact, can have a trail, at least initially phase one trail, which is this section um, to the uh, north of, of the transfer station, we would certainly love to have that cleared and completed so that our cross-country athletes and runners can, can use that this coming fall and, um, God willing, with snow, that we can all maybe get out there and ski. And again, I would just like to emphasize that, that um, this is not just solely for our cross-country running athletes and skiers, but really for the entire community. In fact, um, our main tagline throughout the whole project has been that this is a multi-use multi-use year-round trail for the entire community. It is not just, um, not just the Cape Nordic community or the running community. Um, so that's really all I wanted to add. Um, I don't know if hmm. Peter or anyone else wants to add any points or whether we can answer any questions for you, we'd be happy to do so. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, folks. My name's John Upton, and I wanted to add a few additional thoughts to the uh, presentation tonight. I uh, have a long history with Cape Nordic. My wife Annie and I um, really were one of the original founders of Cape Nordic back in 1993, and we coached Cape Nordic for 10 years. And from that experience, I, I just wanted to add a, a little bit of historical perspective. 
and then also give you, I think, some further thoughts about the wisdom of using a professional trail designer and really developing this the right way. From the historical perspective, um, literally, I think I've skied on every bit of open space in, in uh, Cape Elizabeth, whether it's been uh, at Perpudic or open fields or, um, and then more recently, traveling to Smiling Hill Farm, which used to have an area out there. We've been to Perpudic. Uh, I mentioned that. We've also been to Twinbrook and more recently now out to, uh, uh, to Pineland Farms. And from that experience, I can tell you that even if the kids could use a facility like this uh, for Nordic skiing a half dozen or ten times a year, it would be a great uh, time savings for the kids. It literally takes two hours uh, of loading off and on to get onto buses to travel just to, to Twinbrook. Uh, and uh, at a short night like we have in the winter, it's very difficult to get that in and have a meaningful day. So to, in, to any extent that we can use a professionally designed trail in, in Cape Elizabeth, we're in a, a greatly advantaged situation for the kids. Uh, from a little bit broader perspective, I, I've had uh, an experience to ski on John Morton trails in multiple locations in Maine. He's designed trails up in Fort Kent and in a rustic county in, in Presque Isle that are the site of World Cup championship races. Uh, there was a World Junior Biathlon Championship in Presque Isle. He's designed all of those trails. He's also designed trails at Pineland, uh, Twinbrook he designed. There's a trail at Grey New Gloucester High School. He's really a world-class trail designer. And I can't tell you how uh, important it is to utilize the professional services like that. If you just go out and add on to an existing trail, um, you're, you're not going to be happy with the product. John knows how to make something fun for the whole community, not just racers and, and uh, competition runners. It, it will be, I think you can see from the twisting and turning, he, he, he knows how to make uh, the best advantage of the land so that it's fun to ski or fun to run, uh, that'll hold the snow, that'll be safe, and we're really uh, be a wonderful asset for the community if we go forward with this, and I hope you'll uh, approve it tonight. Hi, council members. My name is Annie Upton. I'm John's wife and was also co-founder and past president and coach of Cape Nordic. Um, I'd like to just add a slightly different perspective, and that is that I'm former all of those things, and so that means that I'm not currently involved with the team except that I support them as much as I can. But it also means that I am still a skier and an avid walker and a hiker, and I use the trails in Cape Elizabeth on a daily basis, and I really appreciate the amenities that the trail systems that we have here um, provide community members. But I have to say that this particular trail system that I've had the opportunity to walk with the others um, is very different from uh, those that the uh, land trust offers or even that uh, our access to the waterfront has because of the design of John Morton and the terrain that it affords. Um, and with that in mind, it, it appeals to me um, the, just the idea and the thought that I could go and ski or walk or hike over there and see some of the other people that I've enjoyed knowing through the community of Cape Elizabeth and Cape Nordic. Um, the idea that I would see former high school students come back when they're on Christmas vacation or whatever from college and have them out there skiing and participating, that we could all um, just have that sense of community from Cape Elizabeth from a very, very successful ski team that we've had. Um, to have a gathering place like that without having to drive independently up to Pineland, which is a 40-minute drive, or to Twinbrook, which is uh, about a 25-minute drive, to have Cape Elizabeth visiting these other places. It would be just great to have a gathering place um, for those of us and the whole community to participate um, on a very professionally designed trail system. And I also wanted to add that John Morton's trails tend to hold snow so that when we do get the snow, the way they're designed um, will probably hold whatever snow we have better than not. So that's a, a plus two. So I just I really urge you to approve this plan. It's a great plan. There's a lot of energy and effort around it and support, uh, both financially and voluntarily. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Dunphy, and I'll 
be happy to answer or field any questions you may have. Thank you for that great presentation. And I'm sure there are some questions, so we'll start with. Is it Councilor Lynch? Do you want to start? Sure. I have a couple of questions. Um, Peter, what you presented to us, I think in November or December, was a 2.5 kilometer trail. Do you know the distance of the trails that you're presenting tonight? Uh, we do. Um, the trail we presented in, in uh, the last time in November, December, was, um, was stated at 2.5, although that wasn't accurate. Um, what what uh, this is similar in um, scope to that in the sense that of this part of it here is, is basically what we propose then. Uh, these parts out here on phase two were uh, features that John Morton added um, on his own, essentially, um, but they really add um, to the value of the, of the whole thing. So it brings it to uh, 4.2 for phase two and 2.4 for um, phase one. So about four miles total. 6.6. Yes. Kilometers. I'm sorry, kilom was that kilometers? Yes, yeah, 6.6 kilometers. kilometers or about four miles. Did you have other questions? Uh, I was out <clears throat> a week ago yesterday. I think it was the last sunny day. <laughs> Walking around where I thought it was flagged. Were, were both sections flagged at that point? Yes. Okay. They were all flagged uh, on, in one day. Okay. Those are the only questions I have. Okay. Councilor Dill. Um, the budget that was on the screen, is that budget for phase one or phase one and phase two? Both phases. Okay. And um, has anyone inquired or looked into the liability piece? Like if, we're, if we develop these trails and share them with snowmobiles and have meets, does the town's insurance we have not done so um, with the town's attorney, but we'll be happy to do so. Um, generally, you get into the liability issues more when you charge money for it. Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, anything like this falls very easily under the town's mm -hmm. insurance policy. And um, hmm. well, that's all I have for now, right now. Thank you. Councilor Fritz. You, you talk about um, cutting and clearing and excavating, and I, I was wondering if excavating is involved in this first phase. Yes, yes, both phases. Okay, and were, when you were talking about OS uh, preparing some designs, mm -hmm. was, was he going to only, are you proposing only phase two to submit to the DEP, or what needs to be excavated and yes based on our meeting with the DEP um, they're only requiring an alteration um, if we dig into the earth in the wetland areas only um, as designated um, on the OST map which um, th this is an overlay of the map um, that OST prepared and as you can see here uh, they didn't even bother to survey it because it's not in the wetland areas. It, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of detailed survey as the wetland areas do. So this is completely out. Um, therefore, they didn't, they had no interest in what, what we did to it, really. I guess I'm concerned about the excavating and how, you know, that it's done properly. Um, in, in that first okay, phase. Um, have yes, John Morton's um, offered to come down and, and talk to the excavator and, and, um, and assist with, uh, you know, instruct, instructions on how to excavate. And is, is that in the budget or is that something? It, it's not at this time, no. Uh, uh, it is actually, yes, um, because we did increase the excavating amount, which would more than cover that. I don't know if... The manager would be comfortable, you know, how, how that ought to work. I'm, I'm, the, I'm not sure. To you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I was trying to follow the presentation. I was in the cable room for a bit. 
you know, I, I did speak with Doug Burdick at the Maine Department of Environmental Protection who, who did confirm that all of the upland area uh, is not within the jurisdiction and they would have no concern with that. Uh, I, I'm not aware that, that the code enforcement officer or the planner have seen the, this latest plan. And we do have a, an existing site plan approval for the, the Gullcrest property that the planning board approved. And I know, and I noted you also have a recommendation here, which I haven't read yet, from the Conservation Commission that came in apparently late today. Uh, you know, so I just want to be clear that, you know, while it's been represented and it's correct that there's no DEP permit, I believe there probably is a, a planning board permit, although that's not my judgment. That's the, ultimately the judgment of the code enforcement officer as to whether or not site plan approval is needed. My guess is that he would decide that it is. Did that answer your question, Carol? Yeah, I think so. And I'm, I'm not sure how we ought to, you know, consider approving this, uh, just concept or, you know. But I guess the other, um, an, a person that was mentioned uh, that you might consult with, um, Karen Tilburg, um, who was in the report. Um, I just, I know her, and I think she would be a very responsible person for you to consult. Um, so, okay. definitely. I'd be happy to do that. The more, the more minds, the better. Not only as an advocate for Nordic skiing, but for the environment and, and the property there. Mm -hmm. Kitty, you actually don't need that microphone. You've got one there, so if you can turn that off, it'd be great. Thank you. Council Knowles. I'd like to make a motion. Are there like, other well, I think then we can discuss first, it some or? more. Okay. All right. Go ahead. That way we can discuss it under the motion. Uh, I'd like to move that the town council approve the course flagged by John Morton and that the council grant the Nordic Ski Group permission to begin fundraising and any required permitting for the proposed competitive trails at the Gullcrest property. I'll second it. Second, Councillor Dill. Discussion on the motion, Councillor Dill. Well, that my my discussion is more of a question what does it mean that we're approving it I just I'm a little unclear about what we're doing so I seconded the motion because I want to talk about it <laughs> um, I'm certainly a proponent of, of this idea but it seems that um, there's still some things that have to be worked out and I'm just wondering if um, if we should have a workshop or um, where we could sit down with the new plans and um, the town planner if that's the appropriate person on the staff side and, and that's that sort of thing I, I'm not trying to prevent it from happening I'm just um, a little unclear what we mean by approving this if, and I realize we're in the midst of discussion of the motion but we have a representative here from the Conservation Commission who haven't yet given an opportunity yes. um, to speak and we do and Mike Pulsifer um, Mike not to put you on the spot but if you'd be willing uh, to come up. Um, we do have a memorandum uh, to the Council from the Conservation Commission dated May 12 that none of us saw until this evening and I have just read. coming in. So none of us have read this other than glancing at it quickly while other speakers were, were, were presenting. Um, so we don't have the benefit of the details here but if you wouldn't mind Mike coming up and giving us the benefit of the Conservation Commission's review of this, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, honestly, some of the information that I saw tonight was, I saw it for the first time. It looks pretty impressive, but uh, some, we've had a couple of meetings. I know Peter has been to at least three of the meetings of the Conservation Commission, and Muzzy was there last week as well. But the information you have in front of you from us, we, we just felt a little unprepared to give you a recommendation. We had some questions that I think they did a very good job explaining a lot of the things, but uh, when it came down to the, some of the detail, it was more, we just didn't feel like that was completely there. Some of this might have answered some of my questions if I'd seen that a little bit earlier, 
but that was the first time I'd seen some of that, the distances and the amounts and the breakdown of monies. Uh, DEP, at, at our last meeting, the DEP hadn't been contacted about this, so I'm sorry if it, if, if it put us in a spot by not making a recommendation, but I, I think the group felt a little unprepared to do that at the last uh, meeting. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Are you in a position to make a different recommendation tonight? Myself, uh, for the Conservation Commission, I feel like I, that might be a little inappropriate for the whole group, but yeah, unless I, just, I could get one of you to do the budget again, maybe one of you, but. <laughs> well, I just ask it because what we got from you suggested that we ought to perhaps have a workshop and try and resolve these questions or. I think that, that was the, the majority of the commission supportive of the idea, mm -hmm. but it does seem like at least some groups think we, there needs mm -hmm. to be more eyes dotted. I think speaking just for myself, I'm very supportive of this idea. I think it would be great for our community, our students, but uh, as, as a representative of the commission, we felt like we needed more uh, information. Other questions for Mike Pulsifer while he's up here from anybody? Thank you, Mike. Um, Peter, did you want to respond to something yeah, like that? I, I just did want to respond. Um, at our um, the conservation commission, my understanding was um, was asked to, or we were asked to work on the design with the conservation commission. So, with respect to the design, originally the trail was even more significant than this. So it, it has been reduced down, you know, as a, a design feature with, based on input from the Conservation Commission. Um, the Conservation Commission offered to uh, abandon this segment here, um, I, you know, as, as another design change, which is this dark blue 550-foot um, boardwalk section in order to, um, you know, allow us to proceed and, and to make it l less of an impact um, as far as uh, wetland disruption goes. And the other um, design um, uh, feature that factored into this was um, the, the Conservation Commission's priority of, of um, the, completing the outer loop trail over here. And um, so we're, we um, uh, accepted that by uh, calling this phase one and doing this first. So basically, we were asked to work with them on design things. A lot of the questions they had um, weren't related to design. So I don't know how pertinent that, um, that kind of information is. A lot of them were excavating costs and things like that were outside the scope of what we were told to work with them on. OK. Thank you. Councilor swift -Kayata. Um I think this is, um, well, to quote John Morton, who I don't know, but I think he uh, summed it up pretty well. He said, it's extremely exciting and daunting at the same time. It sounds like a wonderful project. Um, however, I, I realize we got a bunch of this data at the, at the last minute. I haven't had a chance to, um, and I guess the Conservation Commission hasn't had a chance to absorb everything that we just saw up on the, on the wall. Um, during the presentation, it, it looks exciting, but I, I feel that there are a bunch of unanswered questions, and I think Councillor Dill's suggestion of, work, of a workshop, I understand the, the need to get this moving, but I also think that it, there needs to be a complete plan and all the questions have to be answered just to make sure there isn't a roadblock later on down the process. So I think it would behoove us to have a workshop or, or discussion like that where we can all get together, discuss everything, have the town planner there, the Con Conservation Commission, or at least a representative of the Conservation Commission, uh, the code enforcement officer, just, just everybody who needs to be involved in this and sort of all get in one room and, and deal with it. And I would think that scheduling that workshop as soon as we possibly can would be a good idea. So I like Councilor Dill's idea. Well, I'd just like to say that I think this is a very exciting proposal, and I'd like to see us do whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, I think it's one of the more exciting things we've seen proposed for new recreational opportunities in Cape Elizabeth in a long time. And 
I realize we've got another item on the agenda that's going to be another exciting recreational opportunity that's going to come after this. But um, I am very supportive of this, would like to see it happen. And if we're going to send it to a workshop, I know that the group would like to get started as soon as they can possibly clear all the traps and hurdles that they have to clear to get it going. Um, and I agree, I'd like to see a workshop scheduled as soon as we can get it on the calendar. And if it can be done before our June meeting, great. Um, if not, I guess there's a July meeting, but I know they're antsy to, to move forward and I'd hate, to, I'd hate to see any unreasonable delay in this if we can get the questions answered that councilors have. Councilor Moles. I was just wondering if the council is more concerned about phase one or <clears throat> phase two. Because phase one in the upland area certainly seems, I would think, would have less issues than phase two. Uh, phase two obviously has issues. I was wondering if, if for the purposes of tonight, we could approve phase one and send phase two to workshop so that they can continue on with their fundraising issues. If we could ask the, um, somebody, Peter, Muzzy, uh, whomever, if, if only phase one were built for some reason, is that a standalone loop that works or does phase one not work without phase two? Um, no, I think actually that would be a very uh, suitable um, first step. And I think that um, this phase one section can in many ways stand alone. And it would be terrific if we could gain approval to begin work in that area. And in fact, if, if in fact we were only able to get to, through that section, that would be, uh, I think Peter said 2.4 kilometers of, of trail that we could perhaps have cleared and ready to go for the fall cross country running season. And, and again, this is coming from me and I, maybe David and Peter should address this as well, but I, my feeling is that that would be a terrific first step and that perhaps concurrently we could be working on the obstacles and hurdles that we might have with the DEP or whatever um, while we, if we were to gain, gain your approval to, to start excavation on the upland area, that would be terrific. In fact, in all honesty, I think this is the area um, that is maybe most appealing to us as, as skiers and runners in, in that this is the area that has the greatest amount of elevation and terrain and perhaps is the most challenging section in terms of um, skiing and running. And um, it's also an area that is, is at this point, uh, nothing has been done to it. And, and I think that would be a terrific first starting point. Um, if we could gain that approval, that would be terrific. Councilor Lynch. I'm generally very supportive of this. I think it's an exciting idea. But I think it's also important that we do these things the right way. Uh, we're stewards of the Gold Crest property. Um, we were presented with something in November. And when I say we, I also mean the public. They got to look at a map that showed a 2.5 kilometer loop. We're looking at 6.6 .6 kilometers. While I really think it's a great idea, I don't think trying to have a workshop immediately, some night this week if possible, or next week, and bringing the Conservation Commission in, particularly because we have this memo from them and they've got some questions, and bringing the planner in and bringing the code enforcement officer in and just making sure that everybody thinks this is a great idea I think in the long run it will serve us better than giving approval tonight. I don't know. I may be the only one on the council that's, I think, walked around and checked out all the flags. And again, I, I think it's a really exciting idea. But I'd rather take the time to do it right than to rush in tonight since we're only seeing these maps and we've only just received the Conservation Commission's uh, memo. Tonight. Yeah. yeah I, I, I personally don't feel I have enough information to responsibly vote on it tonight. The next scheduled one is June 22nd. <clears throat> our town manager was just showing me the calendar that our next scheduled workshop is June 22nd. We could do better than that. I would like to think we could do better than that. <laughs> 
mean, you know. If there'd be a way that we could workshop it before our June meeting. I would like to say I'm also in agreement with Councilor Lynch. I think this is a great idea, great plan. But, you know, if we asked the Conservation Commission for a recommendation, and what we got back was that they need more information. If they're feeling like they need more information to even give us a preliminary recommendation, I think would be really putting the cart before the horse if we uh, press forward. So I think we ought to do that. And I think it's in your best interest, quite frankly. There's some planning issues that need to be handled with the town planner, the planning board, code enforcement. And if we can pull all the pieces together and help you, this would be wonderful for the community if we can do it right. Well, we've been looking further at the calendar. Our next council meeting is June 12th, Monday, June 12th. The week before that would be a possibility, the week of June 5th, maybe that Wednesday or Thursday, um, June 7th or 8th. I'm not available. I think the 7th is the high school graduation, whatever that senior celebration is. But I'm otherwise. June 5, Monday. How about the week of May 22nd? Um, I'm out of town on the 22nd, 3rd, and 4th, but I'd be available the 25th or 26th of May. 25th is good for me. 26th is a Friday. But, um, the 25th. 20, 25th is comprehensive, comprehensive. plan uh, meeting. The 26th hmm. is the Friday before Memorial Day. I just have what, to what time is the comprehensive plan meeting? Would it be meet possible to meet just meet prior to that? I'm just seven. wondering because the town planner will probably be there as well. That's right. We have uh, Tuesday, May 30th or Wednesday, May 31st as options. What, the 30th? The 30th or 31st of May. 31st would be better for me. I can't do the 31st, but I can do the 30th. <laughs> I, I think perhaps rather than trying to schedule it right here, we should just by email send, you know, send out a list of dates and then we can all we'll choose one. Choose one or, rather than. Yeah. Or schedule it just at the end of this meeting, but go through it. Or at the end else. of this meeting. Okay, well, the consensus I'm hearing is that we ought to get a workshop, but sooner rather than later, um, with every effort made to get a workshop scheduled before our next council meeting. Besides, it's way too wet to clear trails. <laughs> so we, we do have a pending motion by Councilor Moles, seconded by Councilor Dill. So I will withdraw my motion and recommend that we send this to a workshop. Second. Uh, discussion on the motion. All those in favor of the motion. Okay, it is unanimous. Seven in favor, none opposed. Um, we will find a workshop date, hopefully, before the month of May is out. Okay, thank you. And we'll let you know tomorrow. And then hopefully get it back on the agenda for our June 12th meeting. <laughs> Um, can I make a plan B suggestion, um, which, which wouldn't require the planning board. It's, it's already a section of the approved trail, which is completing this, the outer loop portion right here. Um, so that's already trail that's been approved and, um, and uh, the, the Conservation Commission meets tomorrow. I mean, it's part of the Gold Crest Master yes, Plan. Yes, it's part of the plan. It's a priority of the Conservation Commission to finish that part. And it would be, move, this is it here. It would be just moving it over there. And that, that was something um, Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, um, had suggested, you know, it could be part of that. My sense is that if we're, if we're going to get a workshop scheduled that's mm -hmm. within the next 14 days uh -huh. or 15 days or so, Okay. That we probably ought to take it all up and. It's going to leave all week anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. In, I need to get okay. Out of there, thank you. <laughs> thank you to all of you for the presentation. You're working your way through it and doing a great job. So.
please don't be frustrated by the process. Um, but thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. It's going to be a wonderful amenity when it happens. Yeah. Do you recommend, David, that we proceed with uh, putting together materials so that the DP could also make a decision on the phase two part? That um, why, if, if you don't mind, perhaps talking with the town manager tomorrow about that? Is that okay? Yeah, Mr. I. Michael? You know, going to the DEP requires, you know, any outside agency requires a town council authorization. And I would just publicly discourage anyone from further approaching the DEP until the council authorized me. They had some preliminary discussions. They were good discussions. But, uh, you know, we've already had those meetings with the DEP, and I would think further action ought to await council consideration. David. You don't need to call the town manager tomorrow. <laughs> but can, can we be, Still David, here. can we be, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Are we going to be able to get copies of the presentation yes, that we yes. saw tonight? Sorry, we, we only got the maps this afternoon, so it was good. Well, that would be helpful. It was just a lot to take in, and it was sort of hard to see. Or even if you want to send it via email. Can we send it in the PowerPoint format? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll yeah. forward it to Mike, and uh, you can forward it on. Okay, that's great. Thank you to all of you. Can, can oh, I just I'm sorry, clarify or elaborate on something? I, I know that there is a lot of ongoing trail work. Um, my son has just been working with the Conservation Commission for several weeks. So can we be clear that to the extent that there is trail work that is ongoing, that's already approved, to the extent you all want to go out and work on those trails and it accomplishes your ends and the town ends and the Conservation Commission's ends that that can happen? Well, I don't hear anybody putting a, suggesting that there be a stop to existing trail work yeah. that's been okay. authorized So I just want to be clear to the extent that there's anything that's existing trail work. Yeah. It, How yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I just want to be clear that the, the existing trail work that's, that you've described, and, and we've got other items on the agenda, uh, the existing trail work that's been described versus this is a, is a different width of trail. It's there's, there's, there's lots of different issues. And yes, the existing trail work could go on, but not, but only the trail work that's in the existing plan and in the, the, the existing what, approvals. That's what I meant, but it, okay. All right, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Thank you very much. Next item, 112-2006. Kids turf proposal. And who would like to kick off the discussion of this? Good evening. My name is Michael Ott, and I'm just one member of a 33 member committee that is working on the kids turf effort. I was sitting in uh, Andy Strout's office uh, not too long ago. I'm going to wait to. No? It'll be great, no problem. I was sitting in uh, Andy Strout's office about, I don't know, five, six months ago, and he was reminiscing about his uh, days in high school. And he was talking about his time uh, on the soccer team when they'd play on the lower field behind the high school. Uh, lights were on that field, the community would gather around to watch the games. And when they'd score a goal, somebody would radio down to uh, Mr. Murray in the, in the pit, and he'd blow off fireworks for every goal score. <laughs> and I just heard that story, and I said, you know, we've got to do something about that. That would add a great dimension to town life. This is a classic example of the versatility of the artificial turf surface that we are proposing for that lower turf field. <laughs> this is a, um, a high school in New Hampshire in January. The reality is that you can plow this surface with a standard plow, you leave about an inch, it melts. We see kids out on this field in January, February when the weather turns nice and we get the occasional 35, 40 degree day running around having a great time during gym class. Next slide. This is our field at Gullcrest. I run the youth lacrosse effort in town, and we have not even had our first game yet. We have our first home game 
uh, this Saturday. And again, this is the field that uh, we currently play on. Again, now, that was taken, that was taken uh, before the rain, a couple weeks ago. And we haven't been on the field since it started raining. It doesn't look like that right now. Right. This is just another view of a portion of the field at Gullcrest to show you the, um, the difference between the two. So why artificial turf field uh, for Cape? First of all, all sports will be able to play under the lights. As it currently stands, the lower field will not be ready for play until the fall of 07. Again, the fall of 07 is what I've been told by the school department. If all sports can play under the lights, we'll avoid controversy in the future. We won't avoid a situation where we have haves and have-nots within the community. As it stands right now, when the lights go up on that lower field and they've been approved and they've been delivered, only soccer and maybe girls lacrosse will be able to, be able to use that field. Second point, overcrowded fields. It is not uncommon to have two, three, sometimes even four teams sharing a field. I picked up my son at lacrosse practice a couple weeks ago. The varsity team, the seventh grade team, and the eighth grade team were all on the field. Looked over at the track field, same thing, three teams on that field. As a coach, you cannot accomplish anything positive when the fields are that crowded and it's dangerous. The great thing is a turf field is always ready for play. Uh, games in Cape Elizabeth were canceled on Friday, Saturday, and today. The only Cape Elizabeth team that was playing today was the girls lacrosse team and they were playing in Yarmouth. Which game was originally scheduled here, but because Yarmouth has a turf field, they went to Yarmouth. Right, that's correct. This is very important for late fall, early spring in our climate for both games and practices. Cape culture. Last year, 70% of the high school students participated in athletic programs. Last year in 2005, 85% of the middle school kids participated in Cape athletics, athletic programs. Athletics are a part of our town culture. With obesity rates in Maine soaring, not only in Maine but across the country, we are fortunate that most of our kids in town choose to exercise. Let's do everything that we can to keep it that way. When I first became involved with this effort, my initial reaction was, this is a luxury we don't need. It doesn't make any sense. As I did my homework, and I promise you I do my homework, I realized very quickly that this is a necessity, not a luxury for our town life. I already mentioned the field use versus field capacity issues that we have in town. Our athletic programs have grown dramatically over the years, uh, whether it's the youth programs or at the high school with the addition of football. The reality is our teams are playing games and practicing on the same field. Each and every season that leads to a very rapid deterioration of those fields. We do not have the benefit of a stadium slash game only field like other communities have. Another benefit is that artificial turf fields are actually safer than natural grass fields. This is not the, this is not the, the uh, artificial turf that we played on as kids, the concrete. This has better shock absorption than natural grass. There are no bare spots due to overuse, no sprinkler heads, no divots to cause injuries. Another important point is we have limited, a limited budget and time for our grass fields. I'd highlight the time. You think about it, we use our fields all through the fall. They sit dormant throughout the winter. We use them throughout the spring, and there are literally two months for those fields to recuperate. You cannot maintain a great grass field without resting it for six to 12 months. Our programs are robust, and the reality is we cannot rest our fields for six to 12 months. And this is not a... Um, a slight on Forrest King or Bob Malley of the Public Works Department. In fact, I think they do a brilliant job with what they have. They cannot win, given the situation that we have with the fields. Another shot of one of our fields. This is a shot of the um, lacrosse field. A little dark there, but this is a shot of the uh, track field over by the high school. You see a recurring theme here. This is what it could be. This is our dream. Turf always looks that way. Permanent lines are down. Imagine sitting in those bleachers at the top part of that photo, looking over the marsh, the distant view of the marsh. It could be one of the most stunning settings in Maine. It could be absolutely fantastic, and it's right here for us. We like to refer to this as a multi-use outdoor classroom because that's what we really truly believe it is. 
Field hockey can use this. Football can use this. Lacrosse can use this. Soccer can use this. You can have a wide variety of community services events. Uh, community services camps, right now, they have a problem in the summer because they don't have a lot of places to go because we have to shut down the fields to rest them. PE classes, they could use, schools could be using this facility from 8 to 3 every single day. In foul weather, baseball and softball could use it. There's rental potential. You could have marching band events here. You could have tournament play here. You could have senior bocce ball events. I guarantee you that if we build this facility, we will come up with uses we haven't even dreamed of yet. This is another photo of what it could become. We're a little um, space con constrained down on that lower field, and that's okay. This photo shows that. This could be fantastic. Benefits of an artificial turf outdoor classroom. First of all, play when wet. The weather we've been having, no problem. You could have 10 inches of rain during a week. You can play your games, no standing water. Snow melts quickly. We want to have spring practices. We don't want to have issues with um, uh, starting, starting those practices. Not a problem with this surface. You have superior traction even when pouring. Even in consistent wear, maintenance. This is more economical than natural grass. Permanent lines are always down. There are no chemicals to pollute the aquifer. Uh, benefits continued. Uh, the great thing is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, this surface is shown to reduce injuries, has better shock absorption. Head injuries are reduced by 60% versus natural grass. The great thing is it plays like real grass. Another benefit is we just spent a lot of money on the new gymnasium, the new gymnasium floor. If we had a surface like this, we would un avoid unnecessary wear and tear on that facility. Um, I know that because the lacrosse team is going to be there at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Early evening games. I've talked to a lot of kids at the high school, and they say, Mr. Ott, it would be fantastic if we could go to school, come home, get something to eat, get our homework done, take a quick cat nap, and then come and play our games. So if we had 6 o'clock games versus 3.30 games, how awesome would that be for working parents? The final point is revenue potential for the school in town. We provided you with a model, a financial model, that uh, shows that uh, this facility will actually generate net income. We believe that model is very, very conservative. Uh, with the addition of a snack, sh snack shack and increased uh, attendance, we believe that number could easily double. And that money could be used for helping booster groups and funding the replacement of the surface in 12 to 14 years. Another visual of what the, uh, the field could look like. And again, it always looks that way. This is a, um, a photo of the other side of Gullcrest Field, again, where we have our, uh, our youth games. And you can see the condition there, the ruts, etc. It's not only unsightly, but it's dangerous. And it's embarrassing when we have other towns come to play at our fields. This is my favorite slide by far, and I think it's the most important slide in the presentation. Playing under the lights is memorable for players and spectators. I did it twice as a kid, and I still remember it to this day. It was absolutely fantastic. Positive venue for weekend night activities. This would absolutely boost school spirit. Imagine Friday, nights, Friday Night Lights football games where the town gathers to cheer on their team. Imagine Saturday Night Lights soccer team, so, uh, Saturday Night Lights soccer games, again, where the town gathers, kids are kicking balls around, having a great old time. Enhanced community involvement, again, we believe we'll come up with uses beyond athletics. Uh, this final point is very, very important. I want everybody to really take some time to think about this. Keeping Cape as an attractive alternative. Yarmouth has enjoyed one of these services since 2001. You talk to people in their town, they're wild about it. They love it. They say it's great. And they did a bond for this. Scarborough, I just learned last week, will not install one of these surfaces. They'll install two. Falmouth, Cumberland, and Gorham are considering these artificial turf surfaces. I received a call from a group in uh, Cumberland three weeks ago saying, can you help us? Uh, we want to do a joint bid with you. South Portland has Wainwright. They have 12 fields in that uh, complex. We have six here in Cape. They don't have half the programs that we have. So they can take five, six fields if they want to and rest them without a problem. Cumberland has Twinbrooks, a beautiful facility. Even though they have Twinbrooks, they're talking about putting in one of these surfaces. This will help keep Cape as an attractive alternative within the greater Portland community. In fact, we are, as far as I can tell, the only community in the greater Portland area that does not have lights and or bleachers on a field. Our group believes we can do better than that. 
If you're a financial person, the 10-year cost of a natural grass field to install it and to maintain it is approximately $500,000. The artificial turf surface to install it and to maintain it is about $600,000. The huge difference here is in the available hours of play. You can get about 600 hours, if you're lucky, out of a natural grass field on a yearly basis. A turf field, we believe, you can get at least 2,400 hours conservatively on a cost per hour basis. It's very effective. As an example, uh, Fitzpatrick uses theirs 4,000 hours a year. So this field is a workhorse field. It can be used four times as much as an existing grass field. Again, four times as much, and it'll look great at the end of the day without a problem. You go to Fitzpatrick, 4,000 hours a year for five years, surface looks brand new. These are examples of the cost of some recent installations, Situate High in Mass, Bryant University in Rhode Island, and uh, NYA will be putting in one of these fields this summer. It's another shot of our uh, lacrosse field. And again, one thing I want to mention, the conditions this year, um, prior to this photo being taken, were about as good as you can get in the spring. That's still what the field looks like. These were not taken after the rain. It's another shot of our lacrosse field. On a white background, it would come out much better. This is a photo that I took of the lower field back in February. And uh, you can see what it looked like at that point in time. Flipping to the next one, if we had the artificial turf surface, that would, that's what it would have looked like on that very day. Imagine kids running around out there having a great time. Spring is coming out on the fields. Um, enjoying themselves, seniors getting exercise out there. Again, the possibilities are endless. With this location, we're also very fortunate in that we have a tremendous amount of parking, which is fantastic. You think about it, the capacity of the gymnasium is about 1,800 people. There was a game this winter when Falmouth played Cape, and that gym was packed with people. The school spirit was as high as I've seen it in my time here. It was fantastic. Even though we had snow, snow banks that can, uh, consumed some of the parking places, we had ample parking for that game. So parking should not be an issue at the site. Challenges to overcome. We're going to do this in two phases. The thought is build it and they will come. Phase one is to install the artificial turf surface. We believe that will cost uh, about $600,000, which we'll privately raise. Uh, lights will be installed uh, either May or June. We are fortunate that the National Guard is doing that as a training exercise, thus saving us about forty or fifty thousand dollars. Phase two uh, is to uh, build bleachers, a coach's box, scoreboard, snack shack. Another challenge to overcome is uh, the replacement of the turf in twelve to fourteen years. But with that financial model uh, and, the, and directing those funds to the appropriate place, we believe that uh, that will be done and done well. So imagine this, a stadium type setting in Cape, teams are playing under the lights, the bleachers are filled with parents and kids and grandparents and friends and relatives and sports fans, all cheering for their favorite team. Feel the, feel the Cape Elizabeth pride. Please help us to make this a reality. That's it. we would be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Graham, you want to come up here? There's a pad of paper there that you can put in front of it. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. And thank you personally for all the coaching you've done. Thank you. I have a son who has greatly benefited from it. He's a good man. No. Well, thank you. I like Grant. That's in part because of coaches like you that have helped teach him how to, how to do that. You're welcome. <laughs> well. We've heard two. Wait, can I make one more comment? Sure. My man uh, uh, reminded me that I forgot something. Um, the reason that we're here tonight is to ask your permission for the following. Should have concluded that with that, and I didn't. Um, we are here asking for your permission to raise funds to install the field. Uh, in installing the field, we will work with Public Works, uh, the Community Services Group, uh, school department and whoever else, the town manager, whoever needs to be involved, 
We'll include them in that decision-making process. So number one is to raise, allow us to raise the funds and install the field working with the appropriate people. Number two is to uh, uh, seek permission for allowing naming rights subject, again, to town council's approval. Say that again, please. To permission to allow naming rights on the facility subject to town council approval of those naming rights. And finally, uh, permission to allow for a one fundraising, two-sided fundraising sign uh, somewhere on the town premises. Now we're ready for questions, sorry. Okay. Well, well could, I, could I, David, could I just add, sure, Graham. add Go something ahead. <laughs> um, to this? We've been working pretty hard at this. I was a, Could you please state your name? Graham Smith. Thank you. I was uh, involved in the light project, so I kind of had a little bit of background to go through this. Um, we have gone to the school board and received their approval. Um, Mike and I met with the uh, code enforcement agent, uh, Bruce Smith, last week, and we got a verbal confirmation from him that we do not have to go to planning board. So, um, you know, basically our process is getting approval from you all to start our fundraising. Um, he, he was convinced we don't have to go to the planning board for the turf field, because all we're doing, instead of growing grass, we're going to put turf down. So we received that confirmation from him last week. So just additional information. Okay. I, I have not spoken to Bruce Smith about that, but I'm concerned the town was the applicant for the light project mm -hmm. and made assurances when the light project was approved that the field would only be used so many nights. And I'm concerned that, you know, we, we might lose lose respect to the planning board if we didn't go back to them about the, the great expansion of the proposed use of the field. And I know you were there representing right. with the lights and, mm -hmm. you know, Bruce, uh, mm -hmm. I think that, need, that needs more dialogue because he may not be aware of the assurances that were made to the planning board. And uh, if, but the town is the owner, I, I just get okay. very concerned if the, the, the actual implementation differs from the assurances that were given to the board. Uh, to, just to make a comment on that, our mission is to, to uh, fundraise and build this facility. What the town decides to do with it, what the school board decides to do with it, what the athletic department decides to do with it as far as the hours is totally up, them, up to them. We have no impact on that whatsoever. I, I don't want to get into a debate or argument, but if you're going to present it to people to raise money that it's going to be used for all these different purposes and all these activities, you know, it, it's in keeping faith with those donors uh, that you need, to, you need to have vetted with the proper groups uh, the permission to use it during those times that you're given the assurances. Well. My comment that I was going to make is, on the heels of what we heard from the Cape Nordic folks, we have heard tonight two incredible proposals from citizen groups that have spent a tremendous amount of time that are willing to find private dollars to do something that will be beneficial beyond a lot of our imaginations for the long term. And I my sense is that there's going to be support to help see this happen. The question is, what does it take to make it happen? And I'm sure that there are some questions. And my guess is that if the last item ended up in a workshop, that that's going to be the proper place for a lot of these issues to be discussed, too, in a more informal setting, a more give and take than we have here in the formal council chamber. But that said, what say you all? <clears throat> Councilor Fritz. Um, I, I mean, I think there's some good things about this, particularly we spend now a lot of money taking care of the fields um, just in the last number of years. Um, and they still end up like this with some of the rougher sports that are on them. Um, and your case about the, I mean, we don't have to fertilize an artificial turf and all of that and cause pollution and, and so I think there's some good things but I, I just have I have a sense that for one thing I'm, I'm concerned about the neighborhood that's nearby in, in this particular field 
Um, but I also have a sense that in 14 years, when this, the life of this is up, um, we're going to end up with the cost the next time around. And, and I, I have to consider all these long-term expenses. And are we then going to have demand for this on our other fields? And, you know, that could run up to a whole lot of money. And I don't know that your fundraising efforts are going to go that far. So I, I'm just concerned about really evaluating it um, more. <laughs> And I would like to hear from the neighborhood, particularly um, more intense use, right, right, butting up against that neighborhood. I think is a big concern. Once again, the hours of play will be determined by the athletic department, and that this surface again can uh, sustain four times the wear and tear that a grass field can sustain, and we need we need to have an improved field structure within our community. And this, to me, is the most cost-effective way to do it versus trying to build three or four more fields. I mean, just to add, I, um, one of the things that I've always found very frustrating is that we have to rest the fields and the kids can't play on them and can't be on them. It just it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. It doesn't um, I mean, it does from a maintenance standpoint, but uh, here we have kids that are just, uh, fields that are just sitting empty. When I grew up, kids could play in the fields and, and be getting exercise all year long, you know, just pick up games. And, and I think that's too bad that we don't have that ability right now. Well, the reality is if we install a surface like this, and play is directed toward that surface when the weather turns ugly like it is right now that'll help preserve our existing fields it'll lower the maintenance costs on those existing fields councilor lynch you had your hand up uh, yeah i just want to say i'm generally supportive of the idea my biggest um, concern is the replacement cost we've just gone through a wrenching <clears throat> five-month budget process and I, I would look personally just like to make sure that we've taken the time to look at the fee schedule. I'd like to get Sue's views as the director of all our fields and all our recreation. And I'd like to make sure that the school board is on board with um, gate fees. That I think they've been somewhat um, divided on that. There's sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. But uh, I do think it's a great plan. I'm excited. I grew up with Friday Night Lights. I think it's wonderful. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're not leaving a future council a $500,000 nut that they have to crack in one budget year. So if, you, if we could just look at the gate fees, get a reasonable approximation of what we could do in terms of setting up a replacement fund as we go along, I think it would be. The co-curricular activities committee uh, headed by Kevin Sweeney is looking at that very topic. Uh, it was on their slate uh, May 10th. Uh, they, did not, they did not have a chance to get to it. The reality is if we had to replace that turf today, it would cost $300,000. Um, if we wanted to build a surface like this, Five years ago, it would cost about $1.1 million. Uh, today, it'll cost probably five and a quarter, five fifty. So I don't know where the price of it's going to be uh, in 12, 14 years from now. But I know the generation, the, the new generations will be, uh, I would imagine, uh, greatly enhanced versus what we even have today. And that's why we provide you with the financial model we believe is, uh, is more than conservative. If you took the, the net income raised by this facility and uh, you applied that to the replacement of this surface, and you applied that to aid booster groups, uh, you'd have a, a very positive outcome. Councilor swift um, I, I too think it should go to a workshop because I think there are a number of, of questions. Um, I'm concerned about impacts on the community. I, I should say, first of all, I think it's a nifty idea, but I, I definitely have some questions I'm concerned about impacts on the uh, Elizabeth Park uh, neighborhood. I'm um, 
it, just to make sure they're on board, I remember we sent out a letter, I think, when the lights, not we, but the town sent out a letter when the, uh, the new lights were going to be going up to make sure that the neighborhood was informed since they're abutters. Um, I would also want to, as Councillor Lynch says, want to make sure the school board is sort of on, um, of the same mind with regard mm -hmm. to fees because you've laid out some financial projections here um, talking about how we, uh, we in the town could, through a combination of savings and revenue from gate receipts, save up some money um, to replace the field, but uh, tw at 27000 a year, which is just an approximation, I understand it, it would take over 20 years to save up enough money to pay for it again unless the cost comes down. So I, I'd want to look at sort of the... It would, take, it would take about 10 years. Remember, the cost for replacement today is 300000 not 500000 Okay, even if it takes 10 years, I still would like to make sure that these costs... Um, that we look at them carefully, that's all. I, I'm, I'm very aware that this is the night we passed the budget. And um, I also see there's um, some costs in here for police and supervisors. Um, and I, I would want to make sure that there aren't any public safety issues. I see the chief is here, and I don't know if he's here for this reason or not, the police chief. And have you had meetings with the police department to talk about traffic and public safety and the officers that would be needed. Not a detail. Chief, Chief Williams and I did speak last week. Just I was trying to get some cost information for the financial model. But again, just to reiterate, we've had as many as 1,500 people in the gym um, without an issue. So we I, believe that I, those. I understand that. But we are talking about 49 nights, um, if you add up all these home games, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just something we should consider and I don't know if the chief has any issues that he'd like to speak to tonight since he's here or if we want to invite him to the workshop um, to see if there are any sort of public safety issues or concerns and there might not be but I'd want to know that too. Councilor McKenna. Would you like the podium? Michael I have one question. What's your time frame in terms of starting? When do you need to get this started to meet your objective? Our goal is to have it in this fall. It's an, it's an aggressive goal, but that's our goal. So, so, you so we need to start soon. We have about 25% of the money raised. We have not launched our formal campaign. Um, we were hoping to do that on, uh, on Thursday, and we have a very detailed, thorough campaign that we've laid out. I'd be happy to share with you if you'd like. Just, if I may, Mr. Chairman, if we're going to be going to a workshop on this, it'd be very helpful if counselors could submit their questions prior to the workshop meeting so that in at least a week before hopefully so that everyone could see what they are and there could be time to prepare because particularly if the sense is to put this the same workshop night as the Nordic Ski, there's an awful lot to cover in one evening and I really on both issues would really encourage you to get issues forward similarly, uh, you know, from the staff as well, you know, if we have any issues or concerns with, with either proposal, I'd encourage you to receive them in writing uh, prior to the meeting so you're not hearing them the first time in order to as much as possible, make the, make the meeting productive and, you know, lead toward making a, de a decision at a council meeting at the earliest possible date. Councilor Lynch. And I think um, Mike has pointed out correctly that most of these issues that we're raising are town issues. They're not really fundraising issues, and that's what they want to do. So we just need to make sure that at the workshop we have Bob Malley, we have Sue, we have whoever we need to try and resolve these town issues. And, and we have been keeping Bob Malley, Keith Weatherby, and, um, and Sue up to speed all the, way, all the way. Councilor Moles. Uh, like Councilor Backer, I want to disclose that my son Brian also plays lacrosse. He's their goalie for the sixth grade team. And uh, thank you to Mike Ott for the time he spent coaching that team. Uh, my other two daughters, uh, my, it's my son, but my two daughters, Megan and Katie, also lacrosse goalies. There seemed to be a, a trend going there. It doesn't matter where you are, Moles is in goal. Field hockey, lacrosse, doesn't matter. Uh, I fully support the idea of this field. It's just changing one surface for another, a surface that we can get much more use out of. Uh, 
down the road, the cost to replace that surface could easily be met by a private group or the town. It's a rather small fee, 300000 if it's going to last 10 or 12 years at a, at a, at a time. Um, you know, I'd, I'd rather just approve it now because I can see where it's going. But since we seem to be wanting to go to workshop, I would move that we send this to workshop at the soonest possible date. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Second. Councilor McKinney. So I guess the discussion on the motion is whether we want to try and schedule this on the same evening as the Nordic Ski. And following the town manager's suggestion, if we all prepare properly in advance, we, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do both of these in one evening. I, I agree with you. I think we ought to. We ought, we ought to get it moving because both groups really need to get going on their projects. So make it as timely as possible. I have one more question. Are, are you stuck on having this proposal at that particular field or? It's, it's the one where we can do it the most economically. There's an asset in the ground in that lower field. There's 3,000 feet of drainage pipe. There's a foot of type C gravel that we can use in this process that will save us money. To put lights on a different field would be uh, uh, costlier than it will be uh, to put them on, on right. this lower field. The lights are already delivered. It's the most cost effective location. Part. And actually, it's probably the best location for spectators, too, because if you've ever been to a, a game and there's a track around the field, you're actually a, a, a fair, fair distance from that, from that field, the viewing area. This way, the bleachers will be right on top of the field, overlooking the marsh. It'll be stunning. Do we not have lights on the field by where the track is? No. Because it's far too much of a reach over the track, so it could never economically be done. So the motion is to send it to a workshop and try and get it scheduled for the same evening as the Nordic Ski. All those in favor? That seems unanimous. Take care. Seven in favor, none opposed to send it to a workshop. And we're going to try and get a date scheduled, hopefully, by within the next couple of days and try and get it done by the end of this month. So thank you to all of you who have worked very hard to put this together. We appreciate the professional presentation. The next item on our agenda is 113-2006, July 3, 2006. Will the town manager present this place? Yeah, I'm suggesting uh, that July 3rd is going to be a beautiful sunny day. And uh, <laughs> whereas it, it is the day before July 4th and it follows a, a uh, Saturday and Sunday, July 1st and 2nd, that would constitute a weekend that a, a four-day break would be most welcomed by all those folks at the library, the town hall, the public works garage, and police employees also receive a, an appropriate uh, time off uh, as well to thank them for their work. It's an additional paid holiday, but due to the, uh, the welcome calendar that we see in July, I would uh, ask that the council ex extend this as, as a way of thanking the employees and as a way of recognizing that July 3rd also would probably be a, a fairly quiet day in uh, municipal quiet endeavors. Town. So moved as more fully set forth in our town council agenda. Second. Motion, Councilor Moles. Second, <laughs> Councilor Fritz. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion is approved. Seven in favor, none opposed. Item number 114-2006, Cape Elizabeth Taxpayer Bill of Rights Tax Force. Task Force. <laughs> Either way, it works. Um, as part of our council goals this year, um, we set to um, educate the citizens as to the possible effects of passage of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights if, in fact, it was placed on the ballot. It has been placed on the ballot. Um, so in keeping with our uh, council goals, um, the recommendation is that 
Um, I, as council chairman, be authorized to invite citizens by individual letter and by open invitation uh, to serve on a task force to plan for the possible impacts of Tabor. Um, by open invitation, we mean that anybody is welcome to serve on the task force. And recognizing that the task force will meet over the course of several or many meetings um, in order to sort of close the, the membership or the participation at some point so we don't have people coming in halfway through. Um, this is actually the town manager's suggestion was that we set the first two meetings and anybody who comes to either one of the first two meetings will be considered part of the task force and welcome to participate throughout. Of course, anybody is welcome to come because they will be public meetings no matter how many meetings we have, but in terms of considering and designating those who are formally part of the task force working group, it will be anybody who chooses to come to the first two meetings and make it as open and as inclusive a process as people would like to make it. So you will still already send, or still send a letter inviting as well. We will, and anybody, um, certainly any names that any members of the council would like to recommend for inclusion, um, we will send out a personal letter of invitation to them, um, and we'll consider sending an invitation to all of those who participated in the Pulaski Tax Cap Task Force uh, study group as well. So moved. So moved by Councillor swift Kayata, and was there a second? Second. Second, Councillor Fritz. Discussion on the motion? Councilor Mullins. I have a concern. Let me read my concern. Resolution adopted by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council on September 13, 2004. Resolved, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council urges a no vote on the Pulaski Initiative because its statewide passage will result in chaos and confusion. Due to, the, due to the initiative's unclear and likely unconstitutional language, a loss of decision-making control at the municipal level, and substantial adverse impacts on the ability of towns and cities to provide adequate municipal and school services to their residents. My concern is that this committee will become an anti-Tabor task force. Whether I'm for or against Tabor, it's one thing to inform the public of what the issue is at hand. It's another thing to use it as a weapon for MMA to push their agenda for something that they're concerned about. I personally was dead set against Pulaski because, as it's said here in this, it was very poorly written legislation and would have been devastating. Tabor is a completely different story. And I would just urge the group that gets together that they keep an open mind and, you know, give us the facts of what could and will happen without <clears throat> coming back to the council and saying, we're going to use this as a hammer against Tabor, because there are a lot of good provisions in the bill. Uh, that's enough. Well, your, and your comment is, is well taken. However, having been part of the Pulaski Tax Cap Task Force, along with with um, Councillor Swift Kayata and uh, Councillor Fritz and Councillor mm -hmm. Lynch, who was council chair at the time. Yes? Yes. Yes. There was a lot of discussion as part of that group as to what the proper advocacy role of the task force should be, whether it should be taking a position at all, yay or nay, as to whether citizens should vote for or against the Pulaski Tax Cap Initiative as opposed to trying to <clears throat> provide a rational, factual presentation of what the effects would be. And I think the members of the group felt very strongly that the work product of the group should be factual and not political. Um, the resolution that you just read from September 13, 2004 at the Council was not a product of the tax cap task force. That was a product of the Council. But your point is well taken. And I think it's undoubtedly an item of discussion that will be at the forefront of the first, if not the second meeting. 
with that said, Councilor Lynch. Yeah, you said it well. I won't add anything to that. Councilor Swift Kayada. I, I appreciate Councilor Moles's comment, but I do feel that it would be a red herring for the public. I think that was not a problem with the uh, Pulaski Tax Cap Task Force, of which I was a member. It was a definite nonpartisan group, and as you said, there were members of that task force who were pro-Pulaski, as well as members who were against Pulaski. And I envision that anyone who is interested by having an open invitation like this, anyone who is interested, pro or con, um, with regard to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, they will have every opportunity to join and be a full member of the committee. And everyone gets to express themselves, but the, the purpose of the committee is education and to plan for a potential impact if Tabor is, is implemented. And uh, I, I, so I disagree with uh, where Councillor Moles's comment was coming. I don't think what he read was related at all to the uh, efforts of the Pulaski Task Force or of the Tabor Task Force. David, I just wanted to make clear that, that everyone understands the two-meeting provision. The, the reason for that is, is one administrative, so we know who to send notices to. We can keep track of who's on the task force and have an orderly process. The second reason is so that we don't get the seventh meeting of someone suddenly bringing in 50 new people, as used to happen in uh, the Democratic Party when I was active in it back in the early 70s when some guy named McGovern ran for president. You know, they just stalked the meeting at the last minute to change a decision. And the whole purpose of, you know, this task force is laid out is to, is to educate, to inform, and for them to have a, a deliberative process. It, it's not for someone to come in at the last minute and to try to, up, up, you know, change over the whole process. That's the reason why it's two meetings, and I think that ought, ought to be remembered so that we don't get into a situation that folks either for or against the direction of the committee suddenly we read about it in a newspaper and 80 of them want to come. Uh, it, it, that would sort of nullify the whole process of a task force. To, to, the intent is to depoliticize it. Councilor Lynch. I, and I just want to say, I think it's the people who served on the last task force did come from all ends of the political spectrum. They served on without compensation, truly as volunteers, asking questions. And I think it's a little bit insulting or dismissive to suggest that they were an arm of the MMA just fighting um, a tax cap. I think they looked at the question with fresh eyes. And um, we've talked for months about how we're so lucky to have so very many smart people in this town, and I think what we're talking about in this proposal is to invite anyone who wants to to take a fresh look at it so the public doesn't have to listen to us as elected officials, so the public gets a chance to listen to their neighbors on this issue. And I, I for one, certainly don't think of this as some sort of arm or front uh, waging the MMA battle. I just want to make that clear. So we had a motion from, I don't remember who, and a second from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Six in favor, Councilor Moles opposed. And it is time again for a citizen's discussion of items not on the agenda. Are there any citizens who would like to speak? Seeing none. David, I wanted to say something briefly, and I apologize it was on the agenda. I really want to thank Councillor McKinney as chairman of the Finance Committee for his leadership uh, of, of the process this year. As, as the town manager, uh, with my piece of it, he, he made it uh, very easy to work on and really appreciate from the very beginning when we sat down and tried to figure out the dates and how everything might work. Uh, he just couldn't have been better to work with, and I want to thank him. Well said, and I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Councilor McKinney. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 
probably never has been and never will be. Your building. Move to adjourn. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? We are adjourned.